So, to, to, to the final um, talk, I actually want to talk a bit more about um, our research. And so, you may have guessed that of the herpes viruses, cytomegalovirus is my favorite virus. And so, we work predominantly on, on cytomegalovirus in my lab. And, and what I wanted to do is just talk about some of our research, which has looked at the idea that cytomegalovirus really isn't dormant during latency, it's doing a lot of things during latency to the cell. And so I thought that what, I, what I'll show it is how it targets innate immunity during latency, and that's important for the virus um, in, when it reactivates. So it's actually a preemptive strike by the virus. And so to start with, I started off, I think in the first lecture maybe, and this description of herpes virus infection. And of course, when we draw the diagram, we portray this as a very efficient process. The virus will bind to the cell, do what it needs to do, and make new viruses. And it is all we idealize it as very efficient. But actually, as, as I sort of alluded to in, in the previous talk, a lot of viruses don't make it. They so might find the cell, they might get in the cell, but actually get restricted by the cell. The cell has defense mechanisms to protect itself from these viruses. Because, of course, what the virus is actually trying to do in the eukaryotic cell is infect a hostile environment. The cell doesn't benefit from this infection, it's trying to protect itself. And we know that the cell has protection mechanisms because we, we can identify them and actually identify them because. The virus itself has mechanisms which antagonize these cellular defense mechanisms. It's a constant battle between the host and the virus. I think it's what some people refer to as the Red Queen hypothesis, where the idea in Alice in Wonderland, the Red Queen is doing all the counter run, uh, stand, stand still, and running all the time. And what they're really referring to is that this, the virus is evolving and the host is evolving, but it's not mutually compatible. They're all trying to evolve to be the most efficient, and it's a very myopic view of evolution. It's, it's not, it, it's whilst they are co evolving, they're not co evolving together. And so the virus is trying to get fitter, and the host is trying to get fitter. And so we know this happens during this infection. And what we're particularly interested in the context of virus infection is multiple arms of the immune system. So there's really three arms that we talk about. There's cell autonomous immunity, innate immunity, and adaptive immunity. So adaptive immunity is our B cells and our T cells. It's the, it's the learned immunity that we have, which is very specific for pathogens. Innate immunity is things like natural killer cells, which um, are not specific, really specific, specific virus, but they recognize viral infected cells and will kill them. It's a non-specific mechanism. And we always think about that, really, these, these responses which are important in the resolving virus infection. But what I'm actually going to talk about today is becoming more to do with cell, what we call cell autonomous immunity. And any cell with the nucleus can defend itself against an infection through these very old and ancient defense mechanisms which are encoded by cell autonomous immunity. And what I'm, the structure I'm going to talk about today in the context of lytic and latent infection, is the structure that we call nuclear domain 10 bodies or PML bodies. This is a, this is a cellular protein, which is really an important defense mechanism that the host cell has against virus infection. And it's become it's particularly important for these virus infections. So, what are PML bodies? So, what we have here is a nucleus of the cells. So the blue is the nucleus of the eukaryotic cell. And within that nucleus, we can use an antibody and stain that nucleus for a protein called PML. And you see these sort of green dots here. And these are what we call the PML bodies or the ND10 bodies. And it's not just PML that's in these bodies. They have all these different pro cellular proteins, which can be found. It's not, it's not the same proteins all the time. But the one thing we do know is that they have to have PML, hence why they're called PML bodies. PML is the glue the scaffold that holds these, these structures together. And for a long time, people just thought they were nuclear dumps. The proteins at the cell didn't need anymore and just was putting them somewhere before it got rid of them. What we now realize is they're not just 
they're not, they're not trash compartments for cell getting the proteins. They're actually part of this cell autonomous immunity that can protect us from infection. So what's the evidence that they're actually antiviral? So what we know is, is that viral genomes, when they go into a cell, herpes virus genomes, will get deposited at these PML bodies. So they'll go to the nucleus and the genome will be trafficked to these PML bodies. We know they promote transcriptional repression. I showed you the data from that. And transcriptional repression of viral gene expression. What is interesting to us, and I've talked about in the context of latency, a number of the cellular proteins that are found at these PML bodies are actually histone modifying enzymes, so particularly histone methyl transferases, histone deacetylases, so, so enzymes that would drive a repressive chromatin structure, and then the DNA finds itself there. And so this is, we think this is part of that sort of early silence and that defense mechanism that the host cell has against foreign DNA. But perhaps one of the biggest things that are important in immunity is that interferon inducibles, interferon is potent, a family of cytokines that we have in all um, nucleated cells, which generate an antiviral environment in cells. And then PML is interferon inducible. So if you treat cells with interferon, you get more of these PML ones. And so we know they're important for overexpression studies, knocking out studies, so removing the protein from the cells. And of course, the identification of viral factors, which are important. So actually what I'm going to start with is how herpes simplex virus deals with these structures. And what herpes simplex virus does, and the, the key thing to focus on here is the PML Western block. It has a protein, ICP0, so that, that protein I talked about with David, which is um, important for establishing HSV infection. It degrades PML. And it degrades PML because it's ubiquitous ligase. And so it promotes degradation. And if you degrade PML, you cause a lot of these PML bodies. Because remember, I said PML is essential for the formation of these PML bodies. And so what we know is if we remove the ICP0 gene from the wild type virus, it has a growth defect. Is that reason for that growth defect? Because the virus cannot degrade these PML bodies in them. And so the obvious experiment is if you remove PML from the cell, can you rescue the growth of the deletion virus? And that's exactly what they did. And so we have a control cell or a cell where they deleted PML from the cell and the virus grows to higher sizes. So there's more plaques in the deletion virus. And so this was the first evidence. This is old evidence. This is from uh, 2006, I believe, but actually we knew about this a long time before, that PML bodies are repressive. So that's in HSV. We also know it's true in HCMB. And the key thing here is here, this, this part here, where if we delete PML from the cells, we get more virus infection. So PML is an, is, a, is an antiviral mechanism the cell has, which the virus must antagonize. So if we preemptively remove it from the cell, the virus, of course, will replicate more efficiently. But the issue was, is that actually CMB doesn't degrade PML. So how does it, why is PML important? How does that mean you need to get rid of PML bodies? But what the virus does, it doesn't degrade PML. What it does do is it disperses them. And so what we can see here is a cell. And what we these little white dots, this is very old data, but it's very white dots on the PML bodies of the cell. We can then look in a viral infected cell and we can use two cells here. And what we see is those white dots have gone. So whilst the virus is not degrading the PML, like the ICP0 does, the CMB doesn't have to degrade it. It causes this dispersal. And what we now know is that the virus does degrade a second protein called DAX, which is also present at these PML bodies. And so actually, CMB is having a slightly different target. So PML bodies are antiviral, but the CMB is actually targeting multiple functions here. And I don't think it's important to discuss that, so I want to go back into the PML. Actually, I'm going to keep it focused on, on the PML bodies. And so what we know is, is that the PML body is antiviral. If we deplete these PML bodies, we can make um, the virus cells more um, sensitive to infection. 
The PMR body is an interfering reducible, and actually it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not just to infect itself. What happens is the interferon is produced, and that will, will communicate with neighbouring cells and makes them more antiviral, regulates PMR. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody in the room seems to be using something that is interfering with the newborn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving the mouse and uh, I don't know who it is. That's not that it's me. Um, this time. I think it's just I'm cursed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so what we what we think is, is that PML bodies are an antiviral mechanism that shuts down the viral genomes. It might be part of the mechanism we use it. Is to shut the infant youth as part of that chromatinization response. It chromatinizes the infant DNA, chromatinizes it in a repressed form, and silences the DNA. And the virus, of course, to initiate its infection, has to reverse that silencing. So, of course, what people said was, well, maybe this is why the virus goes latent. In cells where the virus goes latent, it fails to reverse that silencing. And is this the reason why the virus goes latent? And so, if you go back to that, that this slide about latency, what we talked about latency versus infection, remember what we said is the inability to initiate IV gene expression. So, it's a failure of the PML bodies, which is important for this, or a failure to disrupt the PML bodies, or at least a failure to disable functions of the PML bodies. And so, what we know is is that the virus has to neutralize PML activity through direct targeting PML, but also the second protein that's called DAX, which is at PML bodies. And you can see we degrade that protein. And the way it degrades that protein is through a protein called PP71, which is a fossil protein, and it's a protein that comes in with the virus. So it's preloaded into the virus. And what happens is in an analytically infected cell, this protein PP71 translocates to the nucleus. And you can see in the nucleus, it degrades DAX, and that helps the virus to establish an infection. What Rob Glade's group hypothesized was if you take the same CD34 cell, the PP71 doesn't get to the nucleus, it gets stuck in the cytoplasm. And so that antiviral mechanism that's so important to the initiation of lytic infection by disabling the cell autonomous immunity isn't getting where it needs to be. And so that was the proposed mechanism. So actually, this latency that we discussed before, just a failure to, to get around the cells, host cells defense mechanisms. As always is the case, some people follow this work up and suggested it's not quite as simple as that. But I think there's some mileage in this. I think it's part of latency is the inability to, or the failure of the virus to subvert innate immunity. So why? Was I wanted to tell you to introduce this to you because actually, this is sort of the premise of some work that we started to investigate whether cytomegaloviruses have a unique interaction with these structures to allow it to regulate that latency and reactivation. So one of the messages I've been trying to get across is that CMV isn't silent during latency or dormant or, or not doing anything. Whilst it's not making new viruses, it's not replicating its genome, it, is, it does have transcripts that have been expressed. And a number of transcripts have been identified, and these are shown here. So this is just the nomenclature of the gene, or where, where, where it sits on the genome. And so there's a number of different genes that have uh, been identified. What I'm going to talk to today is about this, this transcript from here, the U8182 antisense transcript for called Luna. But what I'll do very briefly is just introduce a couple of other gene products that are expressed during latency, just to exemplify how this virus is active during latency, which seems a little bit like an oxymoron. So one of the gene products that the virus expresses during latency is a gene product called UR1118. And this is, an, this is a viral homologue of interleukin 10. And interleukin 10 is a cytokine that is produced, which suppresses the activity of T cells. So it's part of our homeostasis. So you can, in, in the host, we have to regulate our own immune responses. We do that through partners with the activity of interleukin 10. And what the virus has done is prior to the copy of IL 10, 
and has its own viral homologue. It expresses this during latency, and the net effect essentially of intermediate 10 is to downregulate the immune functions. And it downregulates HADR, which is how antigens are presented to CD4 T cells. And so, what all this means is, is that the virus is reducing immune presentation of any antigens that might be expressed in that relatively infected cell. And so, it's contributing to immunization during latency. The other one that's quite interesting is a protein called US28, which is a GPCR uh, signaling molecule. And it can signal through a lot of pathways that we're really interested in. So I talked yesterday about reactivation using this pathway. And what we know is the virus has a gene product, US28, that inhibits the activity of these pathways during latency. It also includes NF kappa B, which has been shown to drive CMB reactivation for the cell models, and also this transcription factor can play. So the virus is a gene product expressed during latency, which inhibits all these really important pathways, which will drive reactivation. But the really clever thing is we don't really understand how this happens. As the cells differentiate that the virus is latency, this protein switches its activity to start activating these pathways. We don't understand how it does that. And whether it involves other viral proteins. So in the latent cell, this is inhibiting pathways, but as the, as the virus is getting near and near to reactivation, this now starts activating those pathways. And, and so understanding that is ongoing work, which work led by Christine O'Connor and John Sinclair. But what I want to talk today about today is Luna, and we go back to this ability of a viral protein in latency to target a cell autonomous uh, meat. And so this is Luna. It's, it was a transcript which was identified in monocytes, which was latent infected with cytomegalovirus, and it was anti parallel to late to one. So it just, that's not really important to you. It's anti parallel to that protein, or the gene that encodes that protein PP center one that I talked about previously. It's a small protein. It's expressed during the tick related infection. It's been said to have both nuclear and cytoplasmic localization during the tick infection. But we know the transcripts identified in latency. So, what we were really interested in is about that's interesting latency. Does it do anything during the CMV latency? So, just to remind you, is that the virus genetic infection has a protein called PP sense 1 which degrades this protein called DAX, and this is all important for the establishment of this infection. And so I think perhaps quite an obtuse hypothesis, which was, which was proposed nonetheless, is that because this protein Luna is on the antiparallel strands of pp one, they went with this argument, oh, we think it's an antagonist of pp one. I didn't really follow the argument, but this was the argument they made. Not, not, this wasn't block related, this is the people identified Luna. And so, we just thought, okay, let's see what happens if we just take the protein and express it by itself in a cell. And so we transfected the protein. I apologize, it's not, it's not projecting fantastically well, but what essentially what we saw was is that these, these red nuclei here are actually red dots, these are the PNL bodies. In a cell where we have the lunar protein expressed, we lost the PNL bodies. And you can see this here. So we actually have those final protein expressed. We had no longer had red bodies. And if we looked in virally infected cells, and yet far less PNL bodies, there's the green dots here. In a cell where there's green dots, there's no viral genomes, we see the PNL bodies. In cells where we can see the viral genome in red, there is, there is no PNL bodies. And so the virus is disrupting them during latency. We remove the viral protein from the deletion, from the major deletion virus. We now see red dots coercing with the viral DNA. So this was all suggesting to us that actually Luna, this viral protein, was targeting PML bodies during latency for degradation. So why could this be important, or why, why this is important? Well, first, before, before to get onto that, we thought, well, actually, how is this protein, how is it doing this? And so when we ran bioinformatics analysis of this protein, to find out whether it looked like anything else, essentially. It didn't really throw much stuff out. What it threw out was it's not only binding proteins, that's probably that one of series here. Often if you have one of series in proteins, it throws, it throws out RNA binding proteins. But the other one that was interesting to us, it said the C-terminus 
so sort of this here onwards had had homology of ubiquity by modifying enzyme. And what we knew was is that HSPs, ICP0 protein, could promote PL degradation by this E3 ubiquitin ligase function. Problem was, we knew that CV does not degrade PL. So it couldn't be an E3 ubiquitin ligase because we've sort of seen that the virus doesn't degrade PML. Although we do know that CV disrupts PML bodies. So how, how do we qualify these two things? Well, the key thing is, from a biochemical point of view, to, to disrupt PML bodies, you don't necessarily have to degrade PML. All you have to do is remove a post translation and modification of PML. And that post translation and modification of PML is this sumo moiety is added to the PML to post translation and modify it. And for PML bodies, you have to have PML that has this sumo group attached to it, because it is a small protein that's attached to, to PML. So you don't need to degrade it, you just need to desumulate it. And desumulators are in the same family of enzymes as ubiquitin modulating enzymes. And so it uses the same machine as ubiquitin system. And so you can either have ubiquitin attached to the protein, which promotes its degradation, or you can have sumo attached to the protein, which prevents its degradation. The sumo directly antagonizes the activity of ubiquitin because it binds the same lysine residue in, in, a, in a protein. And to cut a long story short, what we identified was, and this is the protein sequence, this is the amino acid sequence. This C here is a cysteine, and that cysteine is the catalytic, well, the putative catalytic side. So what we did was we made a protein, we made a, a, a gene where we mutated the cysteine into a serine. What that does is it makes it an inactive, it made it an inactive enzyme, if this was indeed a cysteine protein. And what we can see quite clearly, if we make a mutant, we now have PML that is now transfected itself. So we have to, the, the lunar has now lost the ability to do this. And what we can see is, if we use a Western blot and look at PML, these higher molecular weight species here are PML just sumo groups attached to it. And you can see it as high molecular weight bands. If we then add a lunar, we lose those high molecular weight bands. So it's not degrading PML itself. It's just getting rid of the sumo groups off the PML. So it's desumulating this protein. Finally, what we knew is, is the virus, these mutant viruses, when we basically re engineered this mutation into the virus, also had a reactivation of the virus. So now what we have is we have a protein the virus expresses during latency, which can target PML bodies. And we have we made the virus mutant that had the defect in its ability to reactivate. So could we join these two things up? But so the paradox we had though, whilst we were doing all this, is that I said right at the start, PL bodies are interfering useful and they're antiviral, and they inhibit. Viral gene expression. That's that, that we know that we know that. And so we have a structure that inhibits IV gene expression. Latency is hallmarked by inhibition of IV gene expression. And so when human bodies inhibit that. So why then does the virus delete something from the cell which inhibits IV gene expression and it's latent? Why doesn't the virus go it? So how can we explain that? Well, the key was, is that the defect in the virus, which had the mutation, wasn't during latency. So what we've got here is just an analysis of what virus cell DNA. And over time, you lose it in the cells as they're, as they're, as they're replicating. But the key point is, it doesn't matter whether it's a wild type virus or a mutant virus in Luna. The loss is the same. So there's no differences in the wild type and the mutant virus. They're behaving equally well in latency. The defect only really reveals itself when you try to get the virus back out of latency. And, and so what this was suggesting was is that lunar's function during latency might isn't actually to maintain latency, it's to get the virus ready or make the virus more efficient for reactivation, to actually come out of latency. 
And so what we thought was, is actually the, the role of the protein was at the reactivation stage. And so IG regulation during latency is PML independent. Other mechanisms are dealing with that, that's protein. But when the virus reactivates and goes back into lytic infections, and says what reactivation is, PML bodies now become a problem because we know PML bodies are inhibitory to lytic infection. And so the hypothesis is the virus is having a preemptive strike and the virus is getting rid of an innate immune response prior to reactivation. It's priming the cell to be ready for reactivation. So how can we test this? So the approach we took was to take a myeloid cell line and use CRISPR to delete the PML protein from those cells. We infect to establish latency and we looked at reactivation. And so the knockout cells, we get slightly more reactivation, it's non specific for the wild type virus. But quite clearly, the two um, mutants, we get a dramatic gesture in reactivation. So if we just get rid of PML, our mutants will reactivate far more efficiently, suggesting that the, what the target of the rebound is PML bodies, or at least PML protein. And if we're getting rid of that, we're rescuing the virus. And so what the model is, is the virus goes into latency, it establishes latency, probably the activity of protein, which is science and viral gene expression. Well, or virolytic gene expression, but there's a subset of transcripts which are expressed in latency, and they have different roles in manipulating signaling pathways, they can be manipulating cell differentiation pathways, manipulating immune responses, and in this case, manipulating an innate immune response with cell autonomous immune response is important for limiting viral replication. And so what the virus is doing in the wild time is eliminating these PML bodies from the cell. So when the cell differentiates into the dendritic cell and the virus then gets the signal to reactivate, the reactivation event is more efficient because it's already got rid of these inhibitors of reactivation. So it, it doesn't actually drive reactivation itself by removing this protein. But what it does do, it makes the virus reactivation event more efficient. Than it does more it does. And we can see that. So we have a virus where we don't have the protein expressed. We have the PML bodies present. And when the virus reactivates, the virus reactivation is far less efficient. And so what the virus is doing is actually priming the host cell during latency for efficient reactivation. And it's by its preemptive removal of a block to lytic infection. And so I'll, I'll finish this talk just to remind you that sort of the three talks that we've had is that what we've seen is that herpes viruses use, redirect, or inhibit host functions to promote infection. And so we see that chromatin is important in the establishment of latency and the silencing of the viral DNA. Is a key event in the silencing of herpes viruses and entry into latency. Cellular microRNAs and viral microRNAs contribute to that silencing. They play a role not only in the initial silencing of the herpes virus latency, but then herpes viruses express their own microRNAs, which contribute to the continued silencing and halting the invasion. It also has a really complicated relationship with innate immune response. So in this infection, PML, which is this key component of cell autonomous or innate immunity, is a really potent antiviral mechanism, which is inhibitory to this infection, and the virus is an antagonist of that mechanism, of that system, which it requires to allow the virus to be lytic. And it's possible that a, a, a suboptimal activity against these structures may contribute to the establishment of latency. Another concept perhaps we have to think about is latency is really an alternative outcome of infection, which could be beneficial to the pathogen. And why do we think it might be beneficial to the pathogen? It allows the pathogen to, uh, to, to exist, possibly for 60, 70 years in a host, and give it multiple attempts to latency and reactivation of transmission events. So these viruses are highly transmissible on a single basis, but if you, if you have enough goes, eventually will transmit. And we know that people are, are infected with these viruses. These are highly seroprevalent viruses. A lot of the pathogenesis we see with these viruses 
tend to be iatrogenic, i.e. it's hospital induced. So immune suppression for transplantation is a major driver of herpes virus infection. Um, and it's become more and more problems. We transplant more people, more bone marrow transplants, more solid organ transplants. It will continue to be a problem. What I want to demonstrate, I hope it demonstrates, is that to the cell and the host, so both from a cellular level, but also from an organism level, that this is a really hostile environment for the virus to admit the infection. That makes sense. All viruses encounter the same hostile environment. But actually, the latent gene is, is actually exposed to the same hostile environment. And it has to do things during latency that allow it to escape that. And I guess the final point I want to make is that my view, and particularly with the beaters and the cannabis sciences, is that the herpes virus latency is not dormant and quiescent. And we often use those words interchangeably, uh, latency and quiescence. I don't think it's quiescence, it's not making new viruses. But it's quite clear that what we're seeing is manipulating the cell, even during latency. Um, to optimize that cell to make it a perfect cell, not only for latency, but also the perfect cells for reactivation. And so I'll stop there. Um, if there are any questions, um, I'll have them taken.